Okay, we had a glitch there a moment. Yes, we had a glitch. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Nurture Now Rules from Slavery to Freedom. This is live, a live Zoom session with Antoinette and Karen. We're live every Tuesday at 7 o'clock Central Standard Time. The talk show where ordinary people would extraordinary. Okay, we had a glitch there a moment. Yes, we had a glitch. Hi, everybody. Welcome <laughs> to Nurture Now Rules from Slavery so to So let me just, this you know what, everybody, we always Zoom have session. these little things going on, but that's all right. That's technology. We're learning. We're doing everything. We operate the switchboard, telling the story and all that. But Karen, in the meantime, you take it over. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, everybody. So glad to see you guys here tonight. Uh, tonight, we are going to talk about um, a little bit of uh, my history with the uh, GU-272. We're going to talk about going from GU-272 to Jesuit enslaved ancestors. And uh, what is the uh, distinction um, between the two? And I'll begin with just a little bit of Jesuit history. And uh, I'm gonna pull up um, just a, a little map that so you can see a little bit of a Jesuit history. Uh, uh, because a lot of times people, when they think about GU272, they think that we're talking about Georgetown University um, specifically. And, and we're not just talking about Georgetown University just because it says GU-272. The GU-272 moniker came about when um, in 2015, students at Georgetown University were protesting the fact that two uh, Jesuit priests had actually sold human beings to two men in Louisiana. And uh, those uh, priests was uh, uh, Father Mullody and um, Father McSherry. And they were gonna name some buildings after those priests. But uh, so the students started using that hashtag, hashtag GU272 in all of their uh, social media communications. And so that's where GU272 comes from. And at the time it was thought that there were 272 people in the sale. And further research has shown that there was actually 314 people in the sale. The sale was to uh, two men, for, um, uh, former governor of Louisiana, Henry Johnson and Dr. Jesse Beatty. When they brought those people to Louisiana, they placed them on plantations in Ascension Parish Iberville Parish or Iberville Parish if you're in New Orleans and Terrebonne Parish. And, and the people who were enslaved on, in those locations are typically known as the GU-272. But I wanted to make a very important distinction. That's why we're saying uh, from GU-272 to descendants of Jesuit enslaved ancestors. If you see this map here, uh, the Jesuits had six stations or farms, as they call them, in Maryland. And uh, let's see here. Those uh, six stations were St. Inigo's Manor and St. Um, St. Mary's Parish, White Marsh, which is its, uh, Prince George's, um, not parish, uh, St. Mary's, um, Mary's County. We have uh, parishes here in New Orleans. In Maryland, they have counties. White Marsh in Prince George's County, St. Thomas Manor, that is in um, Charles County, Newtown Manor in St. Mary's County, and uh, St. Joseph's Farm in Talbot County. Let me just go back to that map. And so, as you could see, um, those, are, those locations are all over Maryland. And uh, there's a little small part, I should have marked it, where Georgetown is. Now, the Jesuits did uh, have some people who were working over at Georgetown. I guess a few actually enslaved there, but the 272 that were sold uh, came from St. Inigo's, uh, White Marsh, St. Thomas Manor, and Newtown Manor. I left off Bohemia. Um, but those were, were the ones who came to Louisiana um, those were the farms or estates that they came from. And I'm gonna stop sharing for a minute here. And um, what, um, when they got to Louisiana, 
you know, obviously had a, a much harder life uh, being so South. Uh, my husband's family comes from the ones, well, he comes from all of them. And that's, that's one of the points we want to make. Mm -hmm. um, those who came to Louisiana are, are genetically related to those who remained in Maryland. Mm -hmm. And when we say GU272, we are leaving out all of those people who were also enslaved by the Jesuits of the Maryland province. And that's why I think it's best that we stop thinking about this in terms of dis being descendants of Jesuit enslaved ancestors, because it doesn't matter where you were enslaved, where your ancestors were enslaved. In fact, we know that some of them left Maryland, went over into Missouri, and some ended up down here in Louisiana in St. Landry Parish. But uh, we're still talking about people who were enslaved by the Jesuits and uh, the people we know today, and we are finding in DNA matches are descendants of Jesuit enslaved ancestors. Thank you, Karen. I have a few questions outlined for you. How did you first hear about the history? Um, in about May of 2016, I saw the uh, New York Times article. And, and that article was being shared on Facebook and I began to communicate with some folks about it. And when I saw that article and I saw the surnames Hawkins and, uh, uh, well, Hawkins, and they talked about the little town of Maringwin, my father-in-law called it Mangren. Mm -hmm. I knew that that was his family. And, and so um, I, I, I started reaching out to the uh, um, genealogist who was working on the project. And um, from there, uh, she, I sent her what I had in my tree and, I, and she sent me back some additional surname groups uh, and that extended the tree. It extended the tree two more generations on the Hawkins line. And we ended up with a whole Butler line that we didn't know about. Wow. How is it your family connects to this history? Actually, I'm gonna pull up um, some portions of our tree mm -hmm. and, uh, and I'll show you um, what we found. Let me just share my screen again. And you'll see, I have my father-in-law, uh, Leonard Royal, and it goes from his mother down the Hawkins line. But um, once you get uh, for a little bit, and it goes all the way back to ancestors that were born around the 1750s, Sam and Kate Hawk, uh, Sam Hawkins and Kate Field. And um, let me make it a little bigger for you. And then, and then um, if you look continuing down that Hawkins line, you'll see where Frances Hawkins married Bibby Ann Butler. Bibby Ann, um, Nace Butler, um, Patrick Hawkins, who's Francis's father, they were all a part of that sale. Now- Can you put the cursor on it because I, I can't follow okay. this. Story. Yeah, okay. I'll have, I have to change the screen to do that. Okay, so you go from Leonard Royal, my father-in-law, mm -hmm. his mother, Miranda Hawkins, his Wally Hawkins, Bibby Ann Butler, Bibby Ann's parents, Nace Butler, um, Bibby Anna Mahoney. Bibby Anna Mahoney, Nace Butler, and everybody moving forward, uh, well, not everybody, up, but up to uh, Francis, they were part of the sale. If I go back to the previous screen, uh, up here where it says Patrick Hawkins and Isaac Hawkins Sr. Uh, Isaac was a part of the sale, but there's no evidence that he ever came to Louisiana, but Patrick mm -hmm. and his children came and, and, and so Francis. So over here, Wiley, he was born in Louisiana. So how many children did Patrick have? Uh, Patrick had nine children. Nine, okay. Yes, and a lot of the Hawkins children married Butler children. Okay. And so did they live close by, did they, did they live close by each other? Yeah, uh, in uh, Iberville Parish, uh, I, they were um, enslaved at uh, West Oaks Plantation. Okay. And and so uh, and these families, oh, I just want to also show that um, 
Georgetown um, put up a marker by one of the buildings that was supposed to be named for one of the priests and, and named it Isaac Hawkins Hall. After your husband's ancestor. Yes, and here we are um, months later, you can see the trees have grown up. This is my husband, Kenneth, and we're there at Isaac Hawkins Hall. How did Kenneth feel uh, just knowing that one of the halls was named after his ancestor? He was um, just- He don't say very much. He doesn't, right. He's a real quiet man, mm -hmm. but he was kind of overwhelmed and just uh, amazed. We had a chance to go back there and look at documents um, uh, at Georgetown. And, and in looking at some of these documents, it was, um, I think that's when the, uh, the real, um, uh, the feelings of, here, I'll, I'll, I'll share a grant, the feelings of awe, uh, maybe that's the word, because, you know, as African Americans, we don't often get a chance to see documents from the 1700s mm -hmm. uh, that has, um, our ancestors' names on it. And it's in looking at these documents at the very moment of looking at these old, old documents, those are originals that's written by Jesuit priests. And this is at the, this is um, uh, Professor Adam Rothman at Georgetown. Was it in English? Yes, yes, yeah. You know, here we're so used to things being in French. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, it was in English. And that, it was at that moment, and it gave me goosebumps bumps, I, I, even thinking about it now, when Adam uh, says, well, here's Sam and Kate. Up until that point, we did not know Isaac Hawkins' parents. Isaac was born- parents is Sam and Kate? Sam and Kate, uh, Sam and Kate. Isaac was born in 1777. Wow. So you can um, guess that Sam and Kate were born maybe in the 1750s. Um, and it was um, just just an amazing um, discovery. I'm trying to advance this um, these pictures, but I can't. I guess I can't advance it in here. It was truly an amazing discovery to um, to see those names on those papers. And I've recently found um, the uh, a record of people born um, at White Marsh um, Plantation and born at uh, St. Inigo's Plantation. And it's all handwritten where every time a child was born, they tell you who they were born to. Um, and to be able to see those records, he, Kenneth was, um, he was really in awe. Karen, how did they choose Isaac to name the hall after him? Isaac was the first person listed on the articles of the sale. Okay. They, it was like an inventory, and, and so uh, they just chose him. Okay. It's ironic now that we've learned that he didn't even actually come to Louisiana, mm -hmm. uh, but he was listed uh, as the first And person. when he was sold, he remained in the area of Maryland? We have the since building? found some documentation. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. One of the letters written by the priest was talking about old man Isaac really missing his wife who was oh. sent to another plantation. So mm -hmm. I, I think that he remained at that plantation because he did not appear on a, the ship manifest. There's one manifest uh, of a ship called um, the Catherine Jackson and Kenneth's other ancestor, Nace Butler, he appears at the very top of the mm -hmm. Catherine Jackson. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, of the of the manifest of the Catherine Jackson. And so, you know, we're, uh, and I say we, because I'm married to him. And, you know, when you get married, it's the joining of families. And, and, right, right, right. And, right. and so, so these are, to me, just as much my ancestors are, as they are his. Mm -hmm. And, and so uh, we are, um, you know, we are recently found out that, um, uh, the wife of Nace was um, was uh, Mahoney. So at the time that we came into knowledge about this history, we didn't know that uh, he was a direct descendant of the Mahoney's. We knew that he had lots of Mahoney uh, DNA matches. And he and I have some of the same Mahoney DNA matches. Wow. Well, can I go back for a minute? 
Mm -hmm. uh, when they said that old man Isaac is missing his wife, at what age was he then? When they did they state the age or did they write it? At that time, when they said he was missing his wife, um, I, I don't know what his age was, but in 1838, when that sale okay. happened, All right, he was yeah. 65. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he that's why I say old man is missing his wife. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. you know what? I'm just glad they didn't say uh, our boy Isaac, you know, because mm -hmm. a lot of times, even when people are elderly, they would call him boy. Yeah. Yeah. We've seen that so many times. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so um, I, um, you know, once I found out about this history, I'm like, well, we got to get these descendants together because mm -hmm. at the time it was said that Georgetown was going to make an announcement about the, um, what do you call it? Uh, the uh, results of their working group. Mm -hmm. And I felt that it was important that descendants would uh, speak with one voice. So I started reaching out to people that I saw in some of the news stories. And we ended up uh, beginning to meet uh, by telephone every Sunday by August of 2016. And that's how we ended up building the GU 272 Descendants Association. Mm -hmm. And then in uh, January, I guess uh, three years ago, four years ago now, right? January of uh, 2017, I uh, became the executive director of the GU 272 Descendants Association. And I remained the executive director until last year in February when I was released because they ran out of funding. And mm -hmm. the bylaws of the organization said that that is a paid position. And, uh, and then once they ran out of, uh, once I was no longer employed, that meant I was no longer on the board. So I am no longer affiliated with that organization but it actually opened me up to mm -hmm. build this online community called Descendants of Jesuit Enslaved Ancestors. And in that online community, we have weekly calls, um, which have turned out to be part research study group, part socialization, part uh, just helping people figure out how they connect to this history. So and you're sharing notes, you're sharing documents, photographs, and oral history on and, those calls. And our DNA, we go deep into DNA matches because a lot of times people will say, wait a minute, I match one of these Georgetown kits. Mm -hmm. And what they're talking about is the uh, one of the alumnus of Georgetown, Richard Cellini created an organization called the Georgetown Memory Project. And initially, uh, Richard's group started, they did all a lot of work on the genealogy. They were looking at that, that list of people who were sold and tracing their lineage forward until they found descendants. Uh -huh. And so they found some of the um, older descendants. Uh, and in ca some cases, they weren't so old. But they tried to get as many older people as possible DNA tested. So they have uh, about 30 or so um DNA kits on Ancestry.com. And if you connect to one of those kits, in fact, uh, I'll-, I'll um, Did they pay for the kit? Did Georgetown pay for the kit? No, <laughs> no. And, and actually that part has uh, kind of nothing to do with Georgetown per se. Okay. Uh, uh, the, the Georgetown Memory Project is, a, is really a nonprofit or organization that has uh, raised money to do the genealogy research. Mm -hmm. Ancestry initially donated some kits to them. Okay. And, um, and I'm just gonna, um, sh since we're talking about these kits and everything. And so, uh, but if you connect to one of those kits, uh, and also if you've done your genealogy and you see that uh, you have some ancestry from Maryland, um, and, and, and does your uh, genealogy research link to one of the Jesuit stations in these various counties where the Jesuits had uh, farms or stations? And then also, if you're finding that you have some DNA links to Louisiana or you have some family links to Louisiana in Ascension, um, Iberville, St. Landria, Terrebonne Parish. Um, and so, with those kits, just because you have a link to the kit, it does not mean that you absolutely are a direct descendant. Mm -hmm. It means that you're related to a descendant. 
And mm-hmm. so that's one of the reasons these uh, Thursday calls are, are a really uh, good ideas because then we can help people try to isolate which one of their lines that they're actually related to. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'll also, um, we have uh, this surname list. So if you connect to these uh, various locations and you have uh, one of these surnames and you can find this surname list on our Facebook page, uh, Descendants of Jesuit Enslaved Ancestors Facebook page. But if you, you know, if all is all of these different conditions, if you meet all of these conditions, there's a good chance that you are a descendant of Jesuit enslaved ancestors. Um, and Tyler and, Perry's uh, family is connected to the Campbell family. Okay. St. Helena. Okay. Now, most of these Campbell descendants uh, from the sale, uh, they, they ended up um, in Terrebonne Parish, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. Um, and so and that's a good you know that's a good thing for people to know but that's why you know if you join our Thursday calls and and you could join the calls by sending your email address to uh, uh, just an inbox message um, at descendants of Jesuit enslaved ancestors but uh, then we could help figure out because you'll get a chance to share your screen we can look at your DNA matches we, if you built your tree, uh, we could just help um, advise. When I say we, it's mm-hmm. some of the descendants who mm-hmm. absolutely know that they uh, descend from Jesuit and slave ancestors, but it is also uh, some people who might connect to one kid or another. Mm-hmm. And sometimes when we're on these calls, people find out that they're related to each other. Right, right. Okay. Those I are some of the most special moments when you see that happens. I know. I know probably lots of joy and excitement and okay. Um, how did you get involved with the GU 272 Descendants Association? Well, it was when I started reaching out to people um, just uh, and one of the descendants in Baton Rouge, she decided that um, uh, she, she, she thought it'd be a good idea if we pull people together. I was um, connecting with her daughter on Facebook. And so I recommended a couple of people that I knew from New Orleans because she had invited me to join this group. And that was the group that started meeting um, every Sunday. Yeah, and it just grew from there. Can any of the descendants uh, attend Georgetown for free? That's a good question. (laughs) That's one of the things. So that's, it's like the, the number one myth. When I run into people, they're like, wow, you must be happy. Your children will get to go to Georgetown for free. I'm like, you can't go to Georgetown for free. You gotta, all Georgetown is offering is a legacy status in the admissions process, which basically gives you a leg up with admissions. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and that's it. That's it, that's it. Mm-hmm. Now I will tell you, uh, Adam Roth, uh, Professor Rothman has been very helpful uh, with uh, you know question, answering our questions when we go there, you know, he is help, um, helpful with letting us uh, look at those documents and the archives and everything. But um, no, you don't get to go to Georgetown for free. Although there are some descendants who are at Georgetown, they've had to go through the regular process for getting financial aid as any other student. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Why are you so focused on the descendants of Jesuit enslaved ancestors? I think since I got involved with genealogy, and I know you'll understand this, it's one thing to research the ancestors, which is a never ending job. Mm -hmm. The opportunity to connect with our cousins in today's world, um, it's it's just, it just feels really, really um, good. It feels, um, you're expanding your family. And I always love helping people and, and I feel like my family has been gifted uh, this information. It was literally handed to us going back to the 1700s and in some areas in 1600s. And you know how they say, uh, to whom much is given, much is expected, or much is required. Mm-hmm. And I just feel like when you're blessed, you should be a blessing. And so because Kenneth is related to almost everybody else in this history, I thought it was a 
he's a good um, baseline. Uh, so if people are trying to figure out if they're related and if they are DNA related to him, uh, we have a better chance of uh, helping them to figure out if they're connected. So basically we're using, uh, you know, part of our family history, but then on those Thursday calls, we have people from other surname groups also there who are also sharing uh, their family history, um, you know, their family tree information, their DNA information. So it's just the way of helping because, you know, it's so hard sometimes to, uh, to bust through those brick walls. And if we could help people bust through those brick walls, we're happy to do it. Are there a lot of young people joining your weekly calls? Yeah, um, actually, well, see, um, <laughs> it depends on how you define young. I consider um, most 20, of them, in their 20s, um, 30, 30s, 30s, 40s. I think most of the people are younger than me. Um, and there's a reason I ask you because oftentimes when we're in our 50s and 60s and we're conducting this genealogy work, research, we're compiling everything we don't want it to go to waste. We want to be able to pass it down to the young people so that they can further the research and, you know, uh, continue the research. And oftentimes people don't really pick this up until they're in their forties and their fifties. That's why I asked that question. Mm -hmm. Well, we definitely have some 30, 30 something year olds, definitely. Well, that's I also have a, uh, 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 a comment in the, um, in the chat room from uh, Connie Green. She says, Karen, did you know that Essie Patha Murkerson ancestors um, has a building named after them at Georgetown? And I will tell you, Connie, that um, Essie Patha Murkerson is my husband's third cousin. And so, yes, uh, uh, Hawkins Hall, Isaac Hawkins Hall is named after their ancestor. Um, yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. And, and so uh, Essie Patha Murkerson, just to uh, give a little bit more um, information on her, she is an actress um, and she was um, on um, Henry Louis Gates' Finding, um, Finding Your Roots. Uh, and they, she, in 2008, she actually came to a reunion we hosted and, and, that's, and, and that was featured as part of that uh, episode of Finding Your Roots where they told her about her history of being descended from a Jesuit enslaved ancestor. Uh, Essie Patha Murkison and my husband both descend from Isaac's son, Patrick. Karen, what else did you find when you was researching? I know you found much more than what you're telling us you found. What other type of documents did you see while researching uh, at Georgetown? Well, uh, one of the things, um, well, and, that, and this wasn't directly at Georgetown, but this is another document um, that, that we uh, have run across, a, a set of documents, something called the Woodstock Letters. The Woodstock Letters can be found online, and uh, they are letters that the priests were uh, writing and, and basically uh, uh, showing you know, what was going on at the different locations. And one of the great things about those Woodstock letters is because they often mention various um, of the uh, enslaved people in those letters. And because we know the names, we know the names of so many of them and we know where they were enslaved, it's easy to uh, make that connection, of, you know, whether or not it's your ancestor. And since, you know, Kenneth is a, a butler, Hawkins, a Mahoney, I think he's a queen. We're still working on that uh, on those Thursday calls. I think we're getting real close to proving it. Um, the queen is another one of the surnames. Um, we we see some of the uh, daily work, um, like a little daily diary of the, the priest. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's so much, and and I've had the opportunity to visit some of those locations because they still have churches on on the land. Um, Karen, yeah. did they mention at any time where in Africa they got some of the people from? Um, and also, did you all find any records of the ships that the Jesuits owned that brought the human cargo to America? They, 
did not um in one of the documents um they mentioned sierra leone uh we think perhaps isaac's family comes from sierra leone the jesuits uh came to maryland in the 1630s and when they came they they had about 59 servants now when i say servants i believe uh those were mostly indentured servants uh, it's not clear if uh, it was a mix of uh, Europeans and Africans, but they had about 59 servants. And um, they uh, had their first, uh, they bought their first uh, property in 1649, 4,500 acres. Uh, so, you know, I'm thinking that in 1649, they definitely had enslaved people because you're gonna need some help with those uh, 4,500 acres. <laughs> What was they raising? What was they growing? Uh, mostly days? tobacco. Mostly tobacco. In fact, uh, one of the properties in 1668, Newtown Manor, they purchased it for forty thousand pounds of tobacco. Mm. Forty. Mm. That's you think. I think about the the labor that was used for free to process forty thousand pounds of tobacco. So the story about Maryland is so important to this overall conversation about the GU-272 because that's where they were able to make the money uh, to expand Catholicism in the Maryland province. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, when they mentioned Sierra Leone, what did you see what did it say about Sierra Leone? Do you remember? Can you recall uh, that? And, and I don't have that document sitting right here with me. Um, uh, they, I think it was they were just talking about um, where somebody came from or something. Okay. Now, and, and it's important to know uh, the Jesuits they purchased some of their enslaved people, uh, and they also got lots of people as bequests when someone died. Uh, the they people will, yeah. they willed them, um, mm -hmm. uh, willed their whole property. That was the case in White Marsh, yes, right. uh, mm -hmm. Prince George's County. They willed the whole property to uh, it was a man by the name of James Carroll. Willed the whole property mm -hmm. to the Jesuits. Did you see any names of ships that they dealt with? Mm -hmm. No, no names no, no. of ships. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the just one of the main questions I get where we came from in Africa. Uh, what ship did we come on? The only name of the ships we have is the, uh, two names of the ships coming from Maryland um, to Louisiana. Louisiana, but nothing prior to that. No, no. It has to be somewhere. Yeah, um, the, the, the Woodstock letters are, I think it's like over 400 pages. <laughs> um, and there's so much more in the, in the archives at uh, Georgetown. Uh, you know, maybe once all, I think somebody said there were over 500 boxes of documents. Oh, really? Uh, and and I bet those 500 boxes may not even be indexed according to the subject. Well, they're indexed. Uh, I was also told they're indexed for the white people. They're not indexed with the names of the uh, enslaved Africans. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the Georgetown Slavery Archives online, uh, they're, they're putting more and more of those documents um, in their online archives, which can easily be searched. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you just want to get over there and, and go through those boxes and find out more. Um, one of the things I do wish Georgetown would do, you know, I know they've received uh, some money to do some research. Uh, some of that research needs to be specifically uh, uh, focused on getting those documents indexed for the people who were in, you know, with the names of the people who were enslaved. Mm -hmm. Because people are looking for their ancestors. I often wonder sometimes uh, because of the Jesuits and some of the ships, some of the captains, the records for some of them. Uh, but like you said, there's almost four to 500 boxes that still have to be looked in. This is a little off the subject, but uh, still part of the family in the in the chat room. 
Somebody mm-hmm. saying, what's the name of the two kids on the bottom left? They're talking about my dad, and I think that's my auntie <laughs> Selena. Uh, they look like my mom, Selena, and my uncle, Wesley. That is because that is your mom, Selena, and your uncle, Wesley. Wesley is my father. That is coming from Yashibi, Israel. And then, uh, so that's my grandmother, Marion, on the right. That's right. That's my grandmother, Marion, on the right. So you must be my cousin. So, uh, well, well, hello, cousin, uh, Yashibi, Israel. Uh, this is my family behind me. And in the upper, above my grandmother, Marion, is my uh, great-grandfather, uh, Shelton Harrell. And then that's me next to him. And then right next to, uh, just move my head out the way you can see Shelton again. And then my dad further behind me. <laughs> okay, um, I lost you for a minute there. <laughs> yeah, I hope you were able to hear. Apparently we have a cousin uh, in the chat room. I heard that. Do you know them? <laughs> I do not, uh, Yashibi Israel. I I don't know you. Uh, I'm uh, hello, cousin. I'm just happy to see you. <laughs> Could you ask them who they are descending from? Uh, yes, Yashibi. Who do you descend from? And I'll I'll put it in the chat. But uh, well, must descend from which one of my um grandmother's children? Uh, grandma Mother. Something. Right, right. Which one of her children do you descend from, Yashibi? Hopefully we will respond. Okay. Isn't that something, huh? That's something. Yes. <laughs> that was a, a another relative. So that picture must be one of the pictures that they have in order to recognize that. Right. Because I, I wouldn't have recognized that was my dad until I was given that picture. Right. Right. And Montero gave it to me and I gave it to you. So they must have a copy of that photograph to be able to recognize it. Yes, Yashibi says, wow, nice to meet you. Okay, Yashibi, which one of Grandma Marion's children do you descend from? <laughs> Hopefully we'll get an answer uh-huh, soon. <laughs> uh-huh. Dwayne Perkins. So that's one of us, Auntie Selena's sons. Oh, that's okay. Welcome, cousin. <laughs> and you see, that's why it's so good to talk about family history, um, open and in the public, because you never know who's going to show up. Auntie when you make a connection. Isn't that something? Mm-hmm. Uh, Karen, as soon as this COVID is um, dying off, have died, or the group looking to go to Georgetown and start looking in those 400 boxes? We, uh, even before that happens, uh, we want to uh, reach out to Georgetown um, to see what can we do because our little group, I tell you, it's like part research group. And we really, you know, if we could get access to those boxes, we certainly would love to get access to those boxes. But even before that, uh, because we have some specific research questions around certain family groups, if we can work with them uh, even remotely to get access to more information specific family groups. We're really trying to help connect the people in Louisiana to the people in Maryland, um, people whose roots are in Louisiana to people whose roots in Maryland. We realize our uh, cousins may be all over the country, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but um, it's it's just so important that, because uh, that for a while people were thinking, you know, GU272, only about those who came to Louisiana uh, especially if you haven't done a DNA test, people weren't really thinking about how expansive this is all the way to Maryland. I mean, we have so many people in Maryland who are connected to this history. And when all of this blew up media, the media still has not focused on all of the uh, Jesuit um, slaveholding in Maryland. And I think that that is the, the next big story. Uh, Louisiana mm-hmm. is a part of the overall Jesuit enslavement story. That is a story that really needs to be told. Sometimes I wish someone like uh, Ava DuVernay could get on this story because this story mm-hmm. includes uh, people uh, fighting hard to get their freedom. 
you know, taking the Jesuit priests to the courts, people running away from their plantations. Mm -hmm. uh, there's so much more mm -hmm. to the story, but we blew up um, when the students were protesting at Georgetown, everybody was just focused on the fact the Jesuits sold people, the Jesuits sold people. Well, the Jesuits enslaved a lot of people. Um, it's not totally clear. I've heard that they uh, enslaved almost a thousand people. Um, and so if two, 314 were a part of that sale, what happened to the rest? We already right. have evidence that many remained enslaved until emancipation at some of these Jesuit stations. Did you find any of the records and notes and daily um, journals from any of the priests? Lots of records, uh, notes from priests, lots. It's, it's mm -hmm. almost overwhelming. <laughs> so much mm -hmm. uh, information that there is out there. It's, um, Did they talk about the conditions of the plantations or the estate? In some cases they did, um, but also there were, um, you know, it's, it seems that the Jesuits definitely wanted their slave people to be married. And that's why we see so many of them having last names. But some of the records talked about some of the priests whipping pregnant women. Um, you know, they, it's, it's so much, um, uh, it, a lot more needs to be told about um, Jesuit enslavement. First of all, they were not supposed to sell them, period. Um, and there were certain around the sale that were never met, such as not breaking up families. Uh, they were supposed to make sure that they were to continue their religious um, uh, sacraments because they were Catholic. Um, they forced them to be Catholic because they was <laughs> you're, you're right. They forced them to be Catholic and many of the families remain very devout Catholics even to this day. Many and do. I don't know how. Sometimes I, don't, I, I, I wonder how. You know, I, I, I wonder how as well. Um, I, I, I wonder how. Um, and here's another comment from the chat room. Um, says, how was I so fortunate to have your Zoom show up in my recommended YouTube I feel like I'm home to be here with y'all and I'm a white guy in Vermont. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, hi, Clay Turnbull. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I hope you're researching your family history as well. <laughs> uh, let's see here, here's another one. Hi, I'm Sarah, I just ran across your live feed. I live in Louisiana. Well, welcome, we well, um, happy to have you here, Sarah and Clay. Um, yeah, yeah, there's so much more to this history. And I hope uh, uh, all of you will follow us on, um, on Facebook, uh, Descendants of Jesuit Enslaved Ancestors. Um, we just want to make sure that, you know, if people uh, have a, a connection to this history of uh, Jesuit enslavement um, and that, that they get to know the, some more of their uh, family members. And we are uh, connected to white people. Um, we had- Karen, uh, it's, it's so hard. It's so hard when someone has to, you know, when someone wanna research their family history and have to look at records like that. And like you say, you know, looking at the judge was whipping uh, pregnant women. And you know that some of those women probably lost the babies, you know from those mm -hmm. beatings because mm -hmm. those beatings was very aggressive. And you, you, you know, you can't help but just put yourself in that place being a woman and being a mother and how hard it is in the first place to carry a child for nine months and everything you go through, the stress of just being pregnant and then to be whipped. Yeah, you know, a Jesuit enslavement was no different than being enslaved anywhere else. Of course, being enslaved in the Deep South was much worse than being enslaved a little further north. But uh, just because they were priests don't mean they treated their uh, enslaved people any different than other slaveholders. They were slaveholders. 
they were priests and they were slaveholders. And that's just the reality. People, yeah, people who came from Africa that was not slaves, free people forced to be held in a system of slavery in this country. You know, um, yeah. And like you said, there's probably so much more in those 400 boxes that will reveal some more pieces to the puzzle to learn. Yes, and though I haven't gone deep into the research, Jesuits uh, enslaved people in other countries as well. Wasn't yes. just the United States. Uh, they enslaved people in other countries as well. And so, that, as I said, there's so much research to be done. Um, but that was uh, one of the little tidbits uh, that, that uh, I learned about in learning some of the history of the Queen family. Uh, they, uh, they enslaved people from other, um, in other countries. You know, so I think- how do, how do your children, you know, the, the offsprings of your husband feel about this history that you are unearthing? Well, my older son, Chris, is, um, very interested in his history. When um, the president of Georgetown came down to meet us, um, we then went to the cemeteries in Maringouin, Maringouin, Louisiana. And Chris is very, very uh, interested. Christopher has always loved history. Mm -hmm. Kendrick, not so much, but Christopher has always loved history. And, and, and I have, even though she's much too young to uh, know anything about this, but I have sent the family tree, a written out, you know, the printed family tree and photographs and everything to my granddaughter in Oregon. That's awesome. That's really wonderful because it needs to be passed on, you know. Uh, and and as she gets older, you know, I'll, I'll yeah. share more and more with her. But uh, I immediately wanted to make sure she had her own photo album of her family members and, and just the printed family tree. What do you think about passing family history down to the next generation and you know what you have read, you know what you have found. You're, you're happy in one regard and you're sad in another regard because you're passing them the pain that you felt when you found it. But then when I stop and think about our ancestors who went through it, they went through it. You know, we're just talking about it but they're, they're the ones who actually went through it. And what we are feeling is no comparison to what they had to go through. You know, so I think we need to get over the fact of not wanting to talk about it because it's too dark or it's too painful. We need to get beyond that because they are the ones who went through it. They're the ones who uh, were strong enough and resilient enough to face those horrible consequences and, you know, that they faced, you know, of slavery and all the, you know, watching their children and their families being sold away or a husband watching his wife, because if she was pregnant, uh, she had a relationship with some man. And even if it was a marriage, let's, let's say if it was a marriage, a husband watching his wife uh, be beat and brutalized and there was nothing that he can do. Well, the truth of the matter also mm -hmm. is that um, many of the descendants have a connection to one of the, a DNA connection to one of the priests. So um, he was fathering children with, with Father, John the Ashton, Father John Ashton. Mm -hmm. And and there is some written um, documentation of him having a relationship with one of the women, mm -hmm. and um, and many of the descendants have high percentages of Irish ancestry. Mm -hmm. So it's very likely they uh, descend from someone um, who may have been an indentured servant, uh, worked on one of those plantations, but. Um, there several descendants I know of have DNA connections that uh, go back to Father John Ashton. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, not surprising, you know, 
and some of the allied families that own um, land around mm -hmm. where the Jesuits had locations, we're finding DNA connections to some of those European families as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I know we have a couple of people who are of European descent in the chat room. If you've done a DNA test, see if you have any African American um, DNA cousins and maybe well, try. Know, they hired them out. So there was some of the uh, enslaved that was hired out to those surrounding areas that you're talking about. And when those women went to work in the houses, you know, they was uh, sexually abused in those houses. Absolutely. They, they hired, they loaned them out a lot. Mm -hmm. Hired them out, loaned them out. Uh, they helped to build Georgetown University. Mm -hmm. um, and who knows what else they helped to build uh, all around the D.C. area. They did help to build the Capitol. Um, and so because DNA is pointing to the evidence of um, uh, European interaction with those enslaved people, mm -hmm. uh, those enslaved ancestors, um, it happened. We have a, another comment from Clay. He says, I've learned from you tonight, did not know about the role priests played. My feminist friends maybe knew. As a white male of privilege, I'm not surprised. I never knew that. He says, it's too damn hard to listen, but I must. Yes, yes Clay. And, and we appreciate that you are listening because um, so this is American history. Yes. You know, it, it's just for descendants of enslaved people. This is American history. Our, our history, we, we know this from just our regular genealogy research. Our histories are intertwined. Yes, and, and it is best that all Americans realize that. Our histories are intertwined. And I think as we get ready to face this, you know, the new inauguration tomorrow, we're seeing what the new America should look like. And it's time now for, for us to brace, embrace a new you know, a, a new pathway so that we can have, you know, a brighter future, regardless to what happened in the past. It's what we do with the moments now and what do we do to move forward and learn about our family history because we must keep in mind that our ancestors was the, they was denied the privilege of reading and writing. We are that generation that, that, that can read, that can write. We're, we're that generation. We're the ones that they hope for that will go back and look at what happened to their lives. You know, what did they have to go through? You know, um, because we, both of us, we descend from both sides, my mother and my father's side of the family. They both was enslaved. There was no free people of color here. Mm. We was both, you know, we come from, enslaved no matter it's all around us it's it's all around there's no way you can avoid you, you know a lot of people don't talk about it families don't talk about it because it's so painful it is but like you said we have to talk about it like clay says he has to listen mm -hmm. um genealogy is one of those ways to bring people together mm -hmm. um uh, somebody here, let's see, Sarah is saying, I've reached out to relatives who live in England, but they don't accept that we're related. And, you know, and, and that will happen, but I would say continue uh, to reach out. And I would hope that people of European descent will reach out as well, because when we work together, that's, that's a way of, of, of beginning to reconcile the past so that we can move forward in the future. And when you think about it, for a lot of Caucasian people, it's hard for them to believe that their ancestor who taught so much hate for people of African descent, but come to find out that the great, great grandfather was fathering children with a black woman. So it's a contradictory to what the family have always taught. But it is also the lack of uh proper, real, accurate history being taught to everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, some people are saying, well, we were never slaveholders. Uh, but yeah, you, then you need to figure out, okay, why do you have uh, black DNA cousins? 
if, you know, some people think of slaveholders being somebody owning hundreds. Some people own one or two slaves. Right. And, and then some people who was borrowing or like you said, they was loaned out or rented out. Well, the children could have come from that type of relationship. No, they didn't own them. That's, that's right. You know, that's but right. she worked in the house. And we don't know exactly what happened unless we find a record of it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what happened back then? But what we know today is we are linked. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and rather than denying, I mean, the DNA don't lie. Uh, you know, I run across many DNA cousins who are 99% European, but they have that 1% African mm -hmm. or 2% African, and they probably never knew they had it until they did a DNA test. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I would and think they would be curious. Right. And it forces everyone to look at their family history. Mm -hmm. You know, learning is, is very difficult for everyone. It's difficult for us, being though that our ancestors was enslaved. And for those who may not want to accept that their family was um, slaveholders or people who held people against their will and made them slaves. That's that's hard too when you when you're against all of those things and you come to find out it is in my family. You know, it's right, there. Right. You know, and so and so like what we're seeing now, some people rather believe the lie mm -hmm. than the truth. We're seeing that right now in America. Right. That most people rather believe the lie. And, 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 and fight to the end, but the DNA does not lie, it's there. And if when you start looking at primary source records, court records, mm -hmm. uh, you know, those records that were written hundreds of years ago, um, they're not lying. You know, when you see court records that have your family purchasing other people or, or that your family was purchased by people, it's, it's in these records. And so just be well, open to the people who were writing those records at that time. They never thought that we would gain our freedom. <laughs> right. We, that we, we would ever have the chance to even get them because again, we couldn't read. Exactly. You know, and, another privilege that was denied for people of African descent. Absolutely. And so, you know, I get, you and I are a lot alike. I get so excited just to talk about this stuff. I know uh, I, I, I'm hearing <laughs> it and you know it. I mean, it's like you, you digest this, you study it, you taste it, you live it. It's in your DNA and you can't stop. Right. I, I can't, but uh, I know we've come to the end of the show. Yeah. And it so, has been a uh, great talk. It's, it, this has been a great informative educational talk show, Karen. And thank you for sharing that information with, with me and the viewers. I'm going to just, as we close out, I want to put up that screen that um, tells people, uh, you know, how to reach out to us. Um, and so, and I'll, I'll join the chat room um, just after the end, because there's a couple of more questions down there. Mm -hmm. um, just after we close out, I'll, I'll join the chat room, but I just want to leave this on the screen. Sure. Um, just so people want to copy this information down. Okay, so you want to go ahead and close us out for next week? Yes, I just want to thank everybody who's watching this show. Thank everybody in the um, chat room. I'll be joining you in just a couple of minutes. Uh, if you have not already, please uh, subscribe to our channel. Continue the conversation by commenting down below. Hit the notification bell so you can be notified when we go live again. We are here every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Central Time.